I am very happy to be here today um, to be able to have this conversation. As Chris said, I've spent time in the region. I've never had the chance to meet you, Clementine. And I thought that mm -hmm. we'd start off, maybe for my benefit and for others, would love to hear more about you, how you got into this line of work, um, and how you, I, this is like, you know, you're taking on the most difficult region, in my mind, you know, in the, in the world, in terms of ongoing displacement and that houses most of the world's refugees. It's about 14 million refugees are in the region. So how did you get in line and you know how did you get started with the work that you're doing? Okay, Galia, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well first let me thank you and thank Northwestern really for this invitation to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you about uh, the work that we do and indeed uh, work that I've been doing for, for many years now in terms of uh, trying to, to serve refugees and trying to support uh, others as we try to address their needs, but more importantly, try to identify uh, durable solutions. Um, how did I come to uh, UNHCR? How did I become a, a refugee worker? Well, to be quite honest with you, um, as Chris said, my... my, uh, my um, how could I put it? My academic background is legal, but uh, I specialized in corporate and commercial law. And that was indeed uh, my very first uh, 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 area of work and where I thought I would eventually make my career. But then after a while, I came across uh, individuals who were working within the UN system uh, and mainly uh, in UNDP, and I did a case, it was actually a commercial case for UNDP in, in Cameroon, where I come from. And the uh, representative at the time uh, offered me a job with UNDP. And I said to him that, uh, what would I be doing in UNDP? My, my, my specialty is, is law, it's legal. Um, I would like to work for the UN, I would like to serve, uh, but um, I wouldn't want to serve in the area of development because I have, have absolutely no background in that particular area. And so he said to me, well, you know, there, are, there is an agency that really uh, uh, recruits a significant number of lawyers, and that's UNHCR. And if you're interested in, in working with the United Nations, why not explore opportunities with, with UNHCR? So I, I walked over to my... Uh, uh, UNHCR office in, in Yaoundé at the time. I, I couldn't get into the premises because it was full of refugees outside. I happened to have arrived on one of the reception days, but I met a young protection officer who um, I asked uh, that I've come to, to learn a bit about UNHCR. Do you have any documentation that I can, can perhaps familiarize myself with the work that you do? And he handed me a uh, uh, a book containing all the various conventions, the Refugee Convention, the various human rights conventions. And I went uh, home and I read through it. And um, it, it really, I really found myself interested with uh, uh, what these conventions were essentially established to achieve. I had another opportunity to speak with him. And um, essentially that was it. And then when I found myself in, in Europe, in Geneva, I walked over to the UNHCR office there and I met one or two people, had a conversation and they said, look, we're looking for young lawyers. Uh, why don't you explore opportunities with, with, with UNHCR? And so I applied and I went back and um, a few, I would say a few months later, they asked me if I was willing to go to uh, a small town called Kigoma, Tanzania, um, in Tanzania, um, in Western Tanzania, bordering the Lake Tanganyika um, because they were looking for uh, staff. Uh, they were about to embark on the voluntary repatriation of Burundians uh, to Burundi following uh, elections. Um, so I arrived in Tanzania in 1992. Um, I immediately sort of started working towards uh, um, preparing for the eventual return of Burundian refugees who had fled in 1972 and who had been in Tanzania for decades. And that was my really my very first, uh, uh, um, I would say, operation. But unfortunately, no sooner had we actually launched the repatriation, there was a coup and we found ourselves in the midst of an emergency and rather than now uh, um, trying to prepare for the return of this group, I found myself 
uh, trying to respond to an influx. We received uh, really in 24 hours close to 250,000 refugees in what was a very remote um, and very rural part of Tanzania. Um, and we set about trying to assist them. Um, that was also the, the following year, we also had the Rwandan uh, emergency. So Tanzania really became the heart of some of the last, largest emergencies at that point in time. And from there, I, I just continued my career with UNHCR. And I've, as you can see, I've worked in a number of, of uh, large scale emergencies, uh, the Sierra Leonean emergency, the Liberian emergency, but I've also worked in um, Southern Africa where really our work was, was somewhat different. It wasn't uh, essentially with large populations, but it was trying to change policy, trying to work with government advocacy and, and so on. Uh, and more recently in Ethiopia, which at the time was the largest operation on the continent, um, it has since been eclipsed by Uganda. Um, and there I had the opportunity to work in what for me was a very unique operation. Um, when I arrived, I would say that uh, uh, durable solutions for refugees were really elusive. We couldn't speak about returns. Uh, other prospects for local integration were bleak. Um, and resettlement, uh, as you know, uh, the resettlement opportunities are very limited and uh, fall far short of the resettlement needs. But that was an operation where we had uh, the full spectrum of what I call the refugee life cycle, from admission emergencies to uh, um, providing support and assistance to them in the 26 camps in Ethiopia, and as well as uh, carrying out at that point in time limited uh, resettlement. The situation changed somewhat. Um, we uh, accompanied the government uh, as they went to uh, what at that time was the uh, Heads of State Summit in New York, uh, from which uh, emanated the New York Declaration. Uh, we became uh, a CRRF country, that is a country, a pilot country for comprehensive refugee responses uh, that would allow a new way of addressing uh, refugee uh, assistance, uh, humanitarian and bridging humanitar um, humanitarian assistance to development assistance. And Ethiopia uh, was a, a pilot country and the government seized the opportunity to make some very, very progressive pledges. And we found a, a, a landscape changing, the landscape changing overnight in terms of doors that were initially closed to us uh, now being opened. We also forged a, 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 a partnership, a collaboration with the World Bank and with their support, their convening uh, uh, authority, we were able to work with the trans, trans um, excuse me, the Ethiopian government to um, effect uh, some very significant changes which impacted sig significantly on uh, the uh, nature and quality of asylum enjoyed by refugees. Um, in Ethiopia, allowing them to achieve uh, a, a much broader spectrum of their basic uh, human rights. And really, uh, I would say achieving a paradigm shift in that country in terms of how refugees are supported. So that really is, I, I perhaps I've spoken for at length in terms of, of how I came to, to where I am today, but just to highlight um, uh, just perhaps two very big situations uh, at the time one being an emergency, but also one in which we were able to bring about some significant changes um, that really will have a significant impact on the lives of refugees in, in that country. Thank you. I mean, that was very informative and really helpful to see the progression. And I was very, um, you know, I know in the region before COVID, it was going to be expanding beyond the work you were doing in Ethiopia. It seemed like the region was really becoming a place of unprecedented opportunity, as you say on your, you know, in your statements about what you'd like, what you had hoped to be developing in the region beyond Ethiopia, um, between the peace agreement in South Sudan um, and the political changes you were noting, you know, in Ethiopia, but also in Somalia and Sudan, um, in line with the global compact of refugees, really set to have these much more progressive policies adopted in different countries and UNHCR was working on developing them. So before we move into how COVID has affected the 
you know, the work that you had hoped to do, I thought maybe you could give just a brief overview um, of what, what, what were the hopes, you know, what was, what was the plans? What did you see that you were going to do, you know, before COVID took hold? I, th I think, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Galia. I think uh, the way I would put it is that um, COVID has delayed the plans. Um, I don't think that uh, um, we will not be able to pursue them because even as we are trying to address the, the very significant challenges of COVID um, and, and, and their impact on, on, on refugees, IDPs and other uh, uh, populations, um, I think I should say that even behind the scenes, I do have colleagues in my bureau still working on trying to move ahead in some of these new directions. Uh, what are they? You spoke about the, uh, the, the, the situation in South Sudan, um, the revitalized peace agreement, and the hope that comes with that, um, the refugees will eventually be able to uh, return um, to South Sudan. Um, that is uh, something that we continue to work on with the government. Clearly, um, we have had our attention diverted from that but we nevertheless continue to monitor uh, spontaneous returns to South Sudan. We are presently working with the uh, government in South Sudan to ensure that refugees have uh, uh, access, can participate in the national dialogue, which is scheduled to take place uh, before the end of this year, because it is our strong view that their voices need to be heard as the country tries to uh, map out a course for uh, uh, populations who will be returning and how following the, the peace agreement um, they can ensure peace, security and prosperity uh, for their country. So we are still embarking on that. Of course the political changes in Sudan itself uh, and Sudanese refugees are one of our protracted refugee situations. They've been in asylum countries for over 30 years so we are hoping that um, with this new uh, dispensation, we can work with the government to try and achieve solutions for that population as well. And we are exploring um, how we can uh, uh, put in place a comprehensive solution strategy that will not only uh, recognize that some people may uh, want to stay in asylum because you know, as you know, return is voluntary, uh, but also that will work with governments in the region to try and achieve comprehensive solutions. And for us, comprehensive solutions are, of course, return, but also local integration. Many of these populations uh, have de facto integrated and governments are becoming more willing uh, to recognize that and to allow them to remain, to access livelihoods and self-reliance opportunities and con to contribute uh, to the communities that host them. We also have, um, we had at some point in time, of course, uh, changes in Ethiopia as well as in Somalia. And um, we continue to monitor the situation. Um, Ethiopia at this point in time is, is facing significant internal displacement of which we, together with our, our UN sister agencies, uh, uh, NGOs, and of course, key stakeholders are trying to, to address the needs um, of the IDPs. But nevertheless, um, we continue to uh, scan the horizon, hope that uh, we can see political solutions that will allow um, refugees, IDPs to return um, in a way that will allow us to move ahead in terms of solutions. In terms of the uh, unprecedented potential that I spoke of. Um, I should say that since 2017, we embarked on trying to really put in place a comprehensive solution strategy for the Somali uh, refugee caseload. They were, to get, they were together with many others, a protracted situation, and we were under pressure from uh, uh, Kenya, who has been hosting them quite generously for some time, to really try and achieve solutions and have uh, Somali refugees return. So we worked on a com com comprehensive solution strategy and we brought on board all the uh, refugee uh, hosting countries uh, um, for Somali refugees. And we put in place uh, a strategy and we put in place uh, plans of action country by country, which essentially gave life to what we call the comprehensive uh, refugee response framework. Uh, it was endorsed 
at the level of heads of states under the auspices of IGAD, which is the regional um, economic commission um, and which covers nine countries in the region. It was endorsed by uh, the heads of states as uh, a regional strategy. And that was really what we would consider to be our first regional CRRF uh, uh, coming out of the New York uh, uh, declaration discussions and in the run up to the global uh, refugee compact. It really provided a whole uh, scope of opportunities for refugees, but more importantly, it also was backed by the commitment of governments at the highest level to work uh, in a concerted way to achieve solutions for refugees. And one of the governments that I will cite uh, by way of example was Ethiopia. Um, I was there at the time, the government recognized that these refugees had been in the country for quite some time. They were de facto uh, integrated, living side by side with uh, uh, Ethiopians of the same ethnic origin and they didn't see why uh, there should be any pressure on these people to return and on the contrary they felt that it would only make sense uh, to allow them to become self-reliant, to access livelihood opportunities and in so doing to also contribute to the development of, of uh, the region in which uh, they found themselves. Now, that declaration, as I said, although it started with the Somali refugees, it gave birth to an expansion of uh, uh, um, comprehensive, those comprehensive solutions and became, as I said, our regional CRF. Shortly after that, uh, states came together and they met to look at how to also ensure education, education uh, to mainstream it and to try and move away from parallel education systems specifically geared for refugees and to try and achieve a greater inclusion of refugees into national educational systems. So there we began with the Nairobi Declaration and with uh, what was the Djibouti Declaration to gradually work with states to achieve greater inclusion of refugees and through the inclusion of refugees in some of these key uh, sectors to ensure that not only humanitarian funding could be used to support them but more importantly development funding as well and there was a recognition on the part of entities uh, such as the world bank international financial institutions and also our donors that the challenges faced uh, by refugees um, living in those uh, marginalized parts of the country for a significant period of time were almost identical to the challenges faced by the host communities, uh, many of the, whom had development challenges. And as a means to bridge humanitarian and development resources, we felt there were opportunities to consider these caseloads um, as uh, caseloads that could be supported in a similar manner. This would allow, of course, for improved peaceful coexistence. Um, entities such as the World Bank and other financial institutions would provide uh, support to governments to allow them uh, uh, take on board this additional number of uh, uh, either it's school children or, or whatever sector it is we were, we were looking at in a way that um, would not be burdensome, but would ensure that uh, the development uh, uh, opportunities for these two groups uh, could be seized in tandem. Uh, following that, we also then moved to the Kampala Declaration, where states agreed to uh, provide uh, greater opportunities for refugees to um, achieve uh, self-reliance to access livelihoods. And I should perhaps underline to, to, to some of our, 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 your guests who perhaps are not that familiar with uh, uh, refugee policies, but in a country like Ethiopia, for example, refugees had limited freedom of movement. Um, they couldn't access the job market. They didn't have work permits. Um, they were essentially confined to the camps and the regions in which these camps were located. And um, many of them were only able to really undertake what we call, um, you know, um, uh, kitchen gardening. Um, but at the same time, through their resilience and through their support, we were able to um, convince the Ethiopian government over time 
that if we weren't able to uh, have them access livelihood opportunities in Ethiopia, then what we perhaps could do would be to prepare them for an eventual return uh, by giving them the skills and the experience that they needed uh, uh, to, to achieve that sometime in the future. This uh, uh, was agreed to by the Ethiopian government. But as we moved uh, towards, as I said, the global compact with the paradigm shift, the government of Ethiopia now decided that it would amend its legislation and it would, in its new refugee legislation, give refugees access um, to uh, uh, the labor market. Um, they would be able to have things that you and I take for granted, such as driver's licenses, bank accounts, um, they would be able to move to work uh, and in so, so doing become uh, self-reliant. So these are some of the uh, significant achievements that we made uh, before COVID uh, with the two declarations, the one on livelihoods, the one on education, and with uh, the governments in the region now pursuing what I would call uh, an inclusion policy, including refugees in education, in service delivery, in health, uh, in uh, also trying to explore how they could also benefit from some of the social protection schemes. Um, we were now having a completely different discussion with governments, and this was something we hoped to build on uh, coming out of the Global Refugee Forum last year and hoping to give uh, a, a, a more greater, uh, um, uh, how would I put it, to realize in a far more extensive way with the support of some of our key partners this year. Now, of course, um, um, you may already know, uh, Galia, that coming out of the Global Refugee Forum, which uh, took place in uh, Geneva last year, governments uh, and uh, private sector uh, entities, civil society, refugees, donors, they made a significant number of pledges around some of these key themes. And it was our hope that in line with what we've been able to achieve uh, with governments, the enabling environment that now existed, we could drive home uh, the full realization of some of these pledges that would bring greater opportunities for refugees and the communities that host them. And I think this is also something that I, I really want to underline that here we were now looking also at the communities that host them in a similar manner um, with uh, the objectives of trying to really improve the lives and having them use the capacity that many of them have towards uh, contributing uh, to the countries that host them. We often feel that refugees um, come to the country with nothing, and indeed many of them come with just the shirts that they have, the shirt that they have on their backs and minimal, uh, min minimal possessions, but they come with uh, capacity. Some of them have qualifications, they have uh, expertise, experience, uh, but m almost all of them have a, a very strong commitment to uh, make the best of the situation in which they find themselves and to uh, coexist in harmony with the populations and in as much as possible achieve a certain dignity and self-reliance um, uh, where that is, is possible to do. So, that is where we, we were at the beginning of the year. It began with great promise coming out of uh, the Global Refugee Forum. Um, we have still continued to uh, uh, pursue uh, those that made pledges. Uh, we have some, some consortiums in the private sector who have come forward and made pledges to support uh, refugees within this region. We have governments that have pledged around livelihoods, have pre pledged around strengthening asylum systems, uh, strength, uh, uh, pledged around education and so on. And we continue to, to work with them. And we've tried to also see how we can re sort of jig some of these pledges to also allow us to, to uh, um, use them even as we are working in an environment in which we have the pandemic uh, as a backdrop. So yes, uh, um, I remain optimistic. Um, the peace agreements uh, will always, for us, uh, be one that uh, are accompanied by great promise, and we will continue to work and make sure that the voices of the refugees are heard. Excuse me. 
but also, as I said, in relation to the Global Compact, uh, the CRF pilots that are in existence, uh, and also the pledges that came out of the forum, we will continue to uh, push ahead and, as I said, use them as best as we can, even during the pandemic. <coughs> I'll give you, I'll it's there. hard on Zoom with voices. Um, so, <coughs> yes. so, some of the, so just in keeping with durable solutions, on the one hand, UNHCR was working very much towards um, returns <coughs> and having, you know, taking in returns for refugees and the other hand, um, finding ways in the cases where people couldn't return to have refugees much more participants um, in designing solutions and also in having solutions that provide for full inclusion in, in a host community. So mm -hmm. let's move now to how COVID has affected this response. You know, so I'd love to hear more about COVID um, within the life cycle, what UNHCR is doing in, you know, in camps the, now, what are the ways in which refugees are part of these solutions um, in keeping with the global compact framework, um, you know, and having more refugee-led uh, solutions. And I know you have something to share with visual images, so maybe should we share those now? Um. Okay, let's, let's, perhaps let's share them at the end, if you allow me. Okay. I okay. think then, then I think it will, it will perhaps uh, have greater meaning for, for um, those who have, have um, joined us. <clears throat> Let me just say that, um, uh, you know, ever since it was, it was declared that uh, the COVID pandemic was, was upon us, um, UNHCR, along with the rest of, of the United Nations here in Nairobi and our partners, we have all been committed to <clears throat> stay and deliver. And our staff and teams, uh, side by side with our partners, have remained in what we call uh, the deep field to try and ensure continuity of, continuity of, of our services, oftentimes using um, novel methods. Um, the Bureau which I oversee is responsible um, for the provision uh, of uh, uh, assistance and protection uh, for 4.6 million refugees and asylum seekers and 8 million internally displaced persons located, as you said before, in 11 countries in the East Horn and Great Lakes of Africa region. It's a very complex and a very dynamic region and the refugee footprint is quite extensive. The majority of refugees uh, uh, and asylum seekers, 2.2 uh, million, hail from South Sudan. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, Sudan, Eritrea, and Burundi are among the other major refugee producing countries of the region. Over 80% of the refugees are women and children. And I should say that the South Sudanese emergency, which is the large largest emergency has been characterized as a children's emergency, particularly given the high number of young children and unaccompanied minors. I should also say that um, the youth bulge uh, that we see on the continent, in other words, high numbers of, of youth and adolescents, is also mirrored within the refugee population. And as always, we have you know, a lot of elderly people, people with disabilities, uh, many with pre-existing medical conditions who, uh, uh, um, with a pandemic uh, upon us, are at a particular risk. Um, the populations reside in both rural, semi-rural and urban settings within and outside of settlements uh, and camps. And one of the things that I also would like to mention is that as we have been talking with governments over time about inclusion, we also in some countries have uh, um, targets in relation to uh, allowing refugees to reside outside of camps. Some governments have put targets and we're gradually moving out of camp-based settings to refugees being hosted within the communities in uh, rural locations or even um, in urban settings, particularly for those who uh, have the ability to uh, 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 obtain employment. Um, as you know, Galia, and uh, I know you're aware, but let me just perhaps uh, uh, um, highlight that contrary to popular belief, 
Um, 85 percent of refugees are hosted in the developing world. Um, in my region, Uganda, with 1.4 million refugees, exemplifies the gener generosity of countries in the region. Uganda is the third largest refugee hosting country in the world and the largest in Africa. Sudan has given sanctuary to 1.1 million refugees, whereas over 700,000 are hosted by Ethiopia. And these are countries which, uh, as you may know, are experiencing their own challenges, um, including uh, internal instability and um, economic fragility. The pandemic um, is not for us uh, a traditional humanitarian emergency. I think that is something as an organization, of course, we, we have the expertise. Uh, COVID-19 is essentially a public health emergency. And it's a health emergency that is, is having far reaching social and economic consequences on each and every one of us. Uh, and with some, I would say, unique vulnerabilities faced by refugees and other displaced pers persons. The uh, pandemic, uh, to me, clearly underlines uh, our common humanity. Um, and, and it's something that I think we, 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 we need to, to, to bear in mind. Um, and it resonates indeed with many of us who work in this area. Um, for refugees and IDPs, uh, because of the crowded conditions in which many live, um, and because of high levels of food insecurity and malnutrition, um, and reliance on crowded and overstretched health facilities, um, we consider them to be particularly vulnerable to uh, the pandemic itself. Just to perhaps give you a, say, a sense of the scale of our preparedness efforts, we have over 100 refugee camps and settlements in the region covered by this Bureau. Uh, we have been working um, to bolster the readiness of some 158 primary health care facilities and 68 government referral hospitals um, to be ready to address uh, the needs of refugees, but also the host communities in some very remote um, and far out uh, locations. We also have significant urban refugee populations in countries such as Kenya, Uganda, Sudan and Ethiopia, and the major IDP operations uh, are in Ethiopia, South Sudan, Somalia, and Sudan. Um, Gallia, I think you could say that this region is plagued by multiple crises in the best of times. Uh, the combination of ongoing insecurity, uh, recurrent droughts and floods caused by climate change, uh, a potentially serious food crisis that we're witnessing this year, uh, cholera outbreaks during the rainy season, something that we've unfortunately become accustomed to. And this year, uh, locust infestations, locust swarms um, that have spread out in the region all have an impact on displaced populations and have increased the complexities of responding to a pandemic where restrictions on movement and physical interaction is a key strategy to mitigate the spread of the virus. We have been working closely with governments in the region, um, as I said, uh, to ensure the inclusion of refugees. And we, in, in the, 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 I would say at the outbreak of the pandemic, um, I think one of our priorities was to ensure the inclusion of refugees in national preparedness and response efforts. Um, the UNHCR High Commissioner uh, said uh, when he was, uh, uh, I think, making a, a statement that, uh, you know, ensuring that refugees are included, um, ensuring that uh, as governments plan, they are part of the planning. Um, it's not just a moral issue or a valued issue. It's in everybody's self-interest from a public health perspective. Um, I believe that we are fortunate uh, the cases among refugees and other persons of concern uh, remained relatively low for the first few months of the pandemic when we were quite concerned and working as hard as we could in a race against the clock to be as prepared as possible. Um, as of this week, our total is around 1,000 refugees 
who have tested positive for COVID in the 11 countries under uh, this bureau. And this is double the number we had at the start of September, but we assume that the increase has a lot to do with more testing of the refugee population that is ongoing. Um, perhaps on the bright side, I should say, we have had only a few deaths and nearly, I would say, the vast majority of those who tested positive are indeed recovering. When we speak about the refugee life cycle, and as you know, uh, uh, one of our, our mandate is uh, protection. And uh, at the beginning of the refugee life cycle, admission is admission to the territory is key. Um, I would say one of, the, one of the fundamental issues of access to asylum and a central focus of our advocacy globally has been on the criticality of continuing to make international protection available to those fleeing uh, wars and persecution. And that measures taken now to close borders for the sake of public health concerns will be temporary and not become the new normal. Unfortunately, uh, the virus itself has not halted uh, conflicts um, in the Sahel, um, outside my region, but the De Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, and elsewhere. Um, we have seen the arrival of new asylum seekers across the continent, uh, and we are aware that there are others crossing borders undetected. Our efforts, as I said, earlier were initially to impress upon governments that their efforts to contain the virus were not incompatible with the admission of refugees. Across the region, we have appealed for special measures to be put in place to allow for asylum seekers to be screened, quarantined and admitted, and for UNHCR and its partners to be granted access to areas where new refugees are arriving. One example of successful advocacy in this regard was a decision taken recently by the government of Uganda to open their border ter temporarily in July to allow some 3,000 Congolese asylum seekers fleeing outbreaks of violence in the DRC to enter. I said um, earlier on that, of course, admission is key. I also mentioned this is a public health emergency. So, our overall goal at the onset was to ensure preparedness and response activities, um, in terms of our preparedness and response activities, I should say, was on prevention. Um, it was to embark on preventive measures. Uh, and we did this in uh, a variety of ways, uh, communication, awareness raising, increasing uh, opportunities for hand washing, hygiene, um, increasing uh, the availability of water, establishing and equipping quarantine and isolation centers, as well as training healthcare workers. We also had to adjust um, food cycles, um, whereas in some uh, locations we distribute food uh, on a monthly basis. We had to now give larger quantities of food for a more extended period of time. Um, we had to also try and adjust our other aid distribu uh, distribution practices to ensure that we could also uh, abide by the social distancing measures. And we also had to embark on trying to undertake remote monitoring and trying to provide remote protection assistance as and where necessary. I would say we have uh, eventually, following a brief suspension in some of the countries, been able to continue most of our essential protection activities, including registration, um, the provision of documentation, case processing for resettlement, um, with, as I said earlier, the necessary changes to adapt to less face-to-face -face interaction. Um, we have been particularly concerned about the impact um, the closure of schools has had on uh, the one million refugee students we have in the regions. Um, and as you know, the implications of so many children, uh, not only refugees, but also uh, nationals, host community nationals, uh, the implications uh, of them missing out on the learning, uh, as well as the safety and structure that school can provide has been a key concern. Um, and we uh, put a lot of effort, uh, as I mentioned early, to ensure 
distance learning in coordination with national authorities. Um, and in this regard, for our region, we included radio broadcasts, online learning, uh, sharing content over WhatsApp and other social media, um, home study packs, um, but it was difficult to reach the required scale, especially when many of these families lack the devices, uh, the tablets that we've all become accustomed to, um, uh, they lacked the devices and were not able to receive uh, the educational contact. In some cases, connectivity uh, was also a challenge. It was either non-existent or it was sporadic. Um, I would say now with school starting, uh, to reopen around the region. We are worried that some learners, especially girls, will not come back to school after extended absences, as many uh, from the information we have as, as we move around and, and engage with the refugees have been sent out uh, to work to support their families. Um, we noticed in Tanzania when schools opened that 50% of young girls did not return um, and this means that we have to now put our efforts uh, together with our partners to encourage parents to send their girls back to school and to develop interventions to retain them in school so that they continue their education. In Kenya, we put in place con community ment mentorship programs um, where volunteer, volunteer mentors uh, were trained um, on not only uh, 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 child protection, but also on sexual and gender-based violence. And we've assigned them to young adolescent boys and girls um, to uh, also monitor, watch, and guide them if they choose to remain um, outside of school. Um, we are critically aware of, the, aware of the gendered impact of the pandemic globally. Um, among refugees, we've also seen increases in domestic violence, sexual exploitation, and other types of sexual and gender-based violence. And this has become a primary concern for, for UNHCR and our partner uh, organization. Um, recognizing that lockdowns, closure of schools, and the loss of livelihoods would put more women and children at risk, um, working groups ha have now been established um, uh, uh, to ensure and to develop modalities to continue prevention and response programs. And I should say, we, we started many of these working groups at the start of the pandemic. Um, the, the, the pandemic hit us here, be, uh, I would say somewhat after um, it was being experienced in Western Europe and North America. So we were able to draw some lessons learned um, in terms of that. Um, so just to say that a lot has taken place um, in relation to sexual and gender-based violence, and we have tried to adjust uh, our mechanisms to respond to the needs of those uh, who have been able to come to us through remote case management, uh, 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 telephones, uh, only prioritizing face-to-face -face management where we identified critical cases. Uh, we've also upscaled our training of caseworkers and also the refugee uh, volunteer workers themselves to, to help us. We increased the number of helplines um, to, provo to provide remote counseling and also appropriate uh, services. So this is something we continue to work on and it will continue to, to uh, take some of our attention uh, for quite some time because of course the impact on SGBV on communities is quite far reaching in terms of families and also uh, the responsibility we have to ensure that women are protected um, is also something that we take um, very seriously. Um, when governments were trying to identify essential services and restricting movement um, only for uh, these essential services, we were able to uh, advocate for many governments that SGBV services be considered as an essential service, uh, allowing us to continue to provide uh, support to girls. Now, I've spoken very much about what UNHCR is doing, what our partners are doing, but I should also say that COVID was an opportunity also for us to work hand in hand with the community-based structures that exist in the camps, whether women, women uh, uh, community-based uh, uh, structures or structures based around youth uh, and, and, and so on. And we have worked side by side in partnership with uh, refugees as well as our partners 
and the host community. Let me just flag mental health. Mental health has also been an area and the need to provide mental health and psychosocial support uh, to the population has also been a major concern. Um, refugees come to the country and many of them undergo significant cha uh, challenges in their actual journey from the country uh, of origin to the country of asylum and arrive uh, um, really uh, 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 with a certain degree of trauma um, and um, need uh, uh, counseling and care. Others, of course, by virtue of the situation they find themselves, um, uh, an inability to really see the future uh, and to understand what the future uh, what lies in the future for them, their inability to carry out uh, 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 what were their, their uh, practices in countries of asylum to support for their support their families, that also has an impact on mental health. And COVID really uh, uh, highlighted the need for us to invest more in this area, uh, but also to support uh, the structures. Um, in the areas that host refugees. Uh, many of them are, are very weak and poor, and this is an area that really we will be advocating for additional investment um, by partners, um, whether our donors or whether um, the international financial institutions to support uh, refugees and host communities in this area. Um, perhaps just to touch on very quickly another area that was not readily visible to us at the beginning, but which quickly became apparent um, uh, as the social distancing campaigns became um, uh, more entrenched and uh, restrictions on, on movement became quite heightened. And in some cases, uh, there were total lockdowns. And what we witnessed was the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. Um, on refugees. Um, and this became, uh, to a certain degree, to a certain degree, um, even more significant than the anticipated health impacts that uh, uh, we had uh, identified. Um, the impact on livelihoods was felt almost immediately by urban refugees who generally don't receive much support, if at all, um, and who rely on daily wages in the informal in e economy. Um, to address this, we have been working with the World Bank to include refugees in their surveys that they've been conducting on the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. And we're trying to work with them to address issues relating to food insecurity. Um, we know that in Kenya, um, some of the refugee households are only able to afford one meal a day. Uh, in some cases, they're only able to have one meal over uh, uh, a number of days. And this uh, challenge is, is, is uh, being experienced by um, 70 to 80 percent of uh, refugee households in Kenya, um, uh, particularly in the urban area. And as you can imagine, this has uh, quite a significant impact on their nutritional status. Um, the impact of remittances, many of refugee households, not only in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas, uh, rely on remittances. And there was a, 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 a quite a significant decline in remittances um, coming um, in their direction in which they could access. Fewer households are receiving remittances. And this, of course, has a knock-on effect on their income as the crisis uh, continues. Um, so that is an area that we're looking at also in terms of trying to see what uh, support we can provide um, in the absence of these uh, remittances. Um, as one could imagine, employment um, has also taken quite a, 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 a battering in terms of um, we have increased unemployment um, and this, as I said, in, in relation to remittances, also has a knock-on effect on income. And the World Bank, for example, has identified that in Kenya, over 70% of refugees reported being unemployed and hence unable to make a living at the beginning of uh, October uh, uh, this, this month. Of course, uh, everyone is losing jobs during this pandemic, but what we are seeing is that the already existing gap between nationals and refugees in terms of employment and wages is widening. 
So this uh, uh, um, this pandemic, um, as you see, is 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 really challenging uh, some of the efforts that we were putting in place to assimilate refugees into the labor force. And uh, we can expect that more refugees will slide into poverty and debt. And in so doing, many of them will be forced uh, to sell their productive assets. Um, I've mentioned the, the urban caseload, and this is uh, an area we continue to work on. Our lobbying efforts um, have had some success. Um, we have been able to convince some governments to explore options to include refugees in new emergency safety net programs. Um, we're seeing this happen in, in, in a few countries, Sudan uh, and Kenya, uh, where urban refugee families meet the relevant criteria um, for government's assistance targeted uh, at the most vulnerable. I said at the onset that um, we, UNHCR, together with our partners, and uh, receiving the support, the incredible support of our donors, um, have been commitment, committed to stay and deliver. Um, but this pandemic, of course, uh, has, uh, uh, um, it's not an emergency in which uh, humanitarian staff are supporting the needs of others. As we support the needs of others, we're also trying to address our own uh, health needs and trying to make sure that we ourselves um, do not form victims of uh, uh, the virus. So it has had this additional dynamic, which uh, has made it uh, quite uh, challenging for our staff, but nevertheless, we have stayed to deliver. Uh, but in so doing, uh, staff welfare has been a critical component of my job um, to ensure that those serving in remote locations uh, in places like South Sudan and Somalia have the support they need um, we've tried to make sure that those who are critically ill can still be allowed, uh, given admission into countries under medevac arrangements. We've tried to make sure that as they support the refugees, that they themselves also have access to mental health counselors or just simply uh, the availability in some of these far, far deep field locations of just food uh, and, and prescription medicine. And these are the things that as we work uh, to support populations that we have the responsibility to protect and assist, we also try to make sure that those who are in service uh, to refugees are also supported as well. Perhaps before I, I, I hand back, I know I've been um, speaking for quite some time, um, I just want to say that um, uh, uh, this advocacy uh, that we are uh, pursuing in terms of including um, refugees in national responses to, to the pandemic uh, is, as I said much earlier, it, it, for us it is just the latest manifestation of uh, the transformative directions of refugee responses in the last decade. Uh, I mentioned the New York Declaration, I mentioned also the Global Refugee Compact, uh, which was endorsed by UN member states in, in 2018. Um, and as I said before, the vision is for refugees to be empowered as productive members of society, pursuing self-reliance and contributing uh, to the communities wherever they are. Um, those of you who have the opportunity, uh, and in some cases I would say the privilege, to work with refugees um, quickly come to realize that refugees do not want to be passive recipients of AIDS. Um, and therefore, we have to really work together to try and uh, really change uh, uh, the way in which uh, they are presently being supported. Uh, last December, at the first Global Refugee Forum, many African governments made commitments uh, to further include refugees in their national systems. Of course, when I speak about health, education, uh, and the economic dimensions of this pandemic and its aftermath, we also realize that inclusion has a cost. And we are actively making a case uh, to the appropriate institutions, including um, the World Bank, WHO, IMF, and our bilateral donors to allocate significant resources um, for countries to respond uh, and that governments should be supported in taking this approach um, in addressing the socioeconomic impacts uh, of the pandemic. So I will stop there.
Um, I hope that I've touched on issues that will uh, uh, stimulate some discussion. Um, and over to you, uh, Galia. Also, I believe we're out of time. I mean, well, you had such a comprehensive um, pre overview and a lot of depth, you know, into the work that you're doing. And I was looking at the questions and you've actually answered um, almost all of them. So I do have, there is a couple though that haven't been, been addressed. And so maybe we could go over a little bit. Um, let me just group them. So one of them concerns the United States. Um, people are asking more, how can we support your work? Uh, the extraordinary humanitarian work you're doing, especially as an international gender champion. And what could people in the United States be doing to benefit the work? But in, cor in conjunction with that, um, you know, how has the United States limits on refugee acceptance affected the work you're doing? Is there any effect? You know, a lot of what you're talking about didn't sound to have a lot to do with the United States taking in refugees. Um, so, you know, if you could just speak to that in conjunction with how we would support your work briefly, and then I, I have another question. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this question. And, and uh, thank you also for, um, uh, I think what I hear is a desire to, to support the work that we're doing um, in this particular uh, space. Just to perhaps say from, from the onset that I would say the US is one of our biggest donors. I think apart from the, the European Union, uh, the US is uh, one of our strongest supporters and has been uh, a very strong supporter of the work that we've done um, over, over, over time and continues to provide us with the resources that allow us to, to do our work. It is not a, only a donor, but it is also a strategic partner. So we very much welcome opportunities to engage with the, the regional refugee coordinators that we have. And we the, UN, U, uh, the US, just to, to perhaps demonstrate its commitment to the work that we do recently, UNHCR, we decentralized and we set set up three regional bureaus in the Africa region, my bureau and the Eastern Horn, um, a bureau in Southern Africa and a bureau covering West and Central Africa. And shortly thereafter, the US government established refugee coordinators in each of these three regions. So I have an interlocutor that works with me in the region and that is, is uh, um, addressing the needs that I take to them in terms of the challenges, but more importantly, also the opportunities. Um, I think, uh, of course, raising awareness about refugees is key. Um, and I think uh, each and every, every uh, individual can contribute in terms of raising awareness and trying to see how in their community uh, they can support refugees. We do have an office, UNHCR does have an office in New York. We do have an office in, um, um, in Washington. Um, there is an entity called uh, US for Refugees that works uh, to fundraise for refugees. It's a key partner and it's, it's been a key support of UNHCR over time. So I would suggest that really uh, you contact our office in, um, in, uh, in Washington. Uh, they will perhaps tell you if, if you are looking at it state by state, if we're looking at it in terms of advocacy, um, where, uh, uh, what their priorities are at this point in time, and what contribution in your own uh, particular way uh, you can make. But the US has also been a significant resettlement country for us uh, over time. And therefore, we have a number of refugees who have um, been able to uh, um, benefit from resettlement opportunities um, in the US. And I should say, for us, UNHCR, we use resettlement strategically. It's a protection tool. And therefore, um, support to those who perhaps uh, uh, have left the region because of their protection needs on their arrival in the US is, of course, critical. But I think, you know, what refugees want by way of, of a message is that they're, they're just like you and I, their, their needs are exactly the same. Resources, of course, are needed, but we, we are increasingly um, uh, trying to expand our support to them where they are, knowing that resettlement is really something that very few can achieve. And really, the vast majority of refugees, the durable solution that they would like to achieve is return to their countries of origin. 
In terms of resettlement, more specifically, one of the things that the Global Compact um, uh, also included was uh, an approach that would help in terms of um, uh, uh, um, responsibility sharing, and that is complementary pathways. And indeed, in the pledges that some of the uh, 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 states made um, at the Global Refugee Forum was to expand complementary pathways for refugees um, in, uh, in not only in my region but globally. And what do I uh, mean by complementary pathways? I mean labor mobility schemes where, whereby qualified refugees can travel, work and perhaps come back family reunification opportunities, study opportunities. These are complementary pathways that we are hoping to expand in support with others to give refugees um, uh, additional opportunities outside of the region. So whereas yes, resettlement will continue to be uh, critical for those who are identified uh, to have a need um, at the same time, um, we can't rely on just a few countries to assume that responsibility. We need to broaden our resettlement opportunities, um, get other countries to take on uh, uh, an additional number of uh, uh, refugees for resettlement, and in so doing, really expand this solution so that uh, uh, it can be uh, a protection uh, a tool and a protection uh, um, solution for, for those who need uh, to benefit from it. But as I said, complementary pathways is something that has come out and is something that even in this region we are working on really uh, and hoping that states will make these opportunities readily available to deserving refugees. Um, I think I've touched on your two questions. Yeah. Is, that, is that it? Yeah. Yes. That's, that's it. I don't think we have any more time. Did you want to share before we leave any of the photos or should we? Um, yes, if we can put the photos, I can I'll try and see if I can talk over them. And if you did have a question and we didn't get to that, um, apologies um, to not getting to your question. I don't know, Galia, can you still hear me? Yes, we can still okay. hear you. Okay, this is a picture of refugees, mainly from Sudan, um, queuing for food and soap in uh, the Jamjang refugee camp in, in South Sudan. And this is just to show you how we are trying to ensure that they can receive food uh, at distributed uh, uh, you know, uh, for their, their benefit, but at the same time trying to comply with social distancing uh, measures. As I mentioned before, the camps are overcrowded, but we've tried to carve out space to try and ensure that we also um, reduce uh, the infection of, of the virus. Um, this is really just an example of uh, colleagues um, who are working even during the pandemic um, in the urban area. We have colleagues in Djibouti, in Somalia, working with refugees, pri providing them uh, with support, uh, assistance, but more importantly, information. Um, and where they can go to in the event they need support, particularly in the urban areas. Uh, next one. Before you continue, so for the questions in the chat, if um, Megan or somebody can copy them, we could actually uh, just compile them and give them to you, Clementine, and maybe respond to you know some of them in another way after the presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, this is just to, to give you a sense of the uh, awareness raising activities. And I should say some of these uh, uh, posters that you see are actually drawn by refugee artists because refugees were also instr instrumental in working with us in, in trying to raise awareness and to prevent the spread of the disease. Uh, water is a scarce commodity in the camps. These are some of the water uh, 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 stations that have been put in place to ensure that hand washing uh, part of the prevention strategy is uh, intensified. Um, and as you can see, when I, I mentioned the number of refugees and the number of camps, um, the fact that we have a thousand um, is something that really we keep our fingers crossed that uh, it doesn't spread more widely in the camps. Uh, and we continue to, to, to step up our efforts to uh, prevent the transmission of the virus in these very uh, difficult uh, uh, locations. So these are refugees in uh, the Mahama refugee camp in uh, Rwanda. Next, please. Um, this is uh, a teacher, Amina. Um, she's in uh, the Dadaab camp in Kenya. 
and she is giving English lessons to refugee and host community students at a local radio station. And this was part of our effort to try and ensure that refugee children and host community children could still access uh, their lessons during the pandemic um, when we had the lockdown and uh, restrictions in movement. Next, please. Uh, this is a young uh, refugee. His name is Innocent. Um, he is in the Kakuma camp in Kenya. He has been making soap and he reduced the cost of soap during the pandemic um, so that uh, not only could we uh, buy soap from him to provide to the refugees, but refugees who had the resources could also uh, buy soap and in so doing, of course, uh, uh, ensure good hygiene, uh, but most importantly, washing their hands and trying to uh, spread the transition. So it's just to the transmission, it's just to, as I said before, um, refugees don't want to be passive recipients of assistance. They want to contribute, they have skills, they come to countries with skills. Um, some of them also learn whilst in countries of asylum and they want to be active uh, uh, participants and to contribute uh, to their communities as, as we all do. Uh, next one, please. Okay, um, with of course uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, the advisories that uh, we wear uh, uh, masks and that uh, masks can help reduce the transmission of the virus, we converted some of the uh, um, the tailoring shops and we invited some of the tailors that we have in the camps, refugees with these skills, to help us produce the masks so that we don't have to buy on the market, but we can actually, uh, through this uh, uh, income generating uh, activity, support refugee, uh, uh, refugees' uh, uh, employment in the camps. And um, in Western Tanzania, uh, a total of 1,200 refugees are being uh, uh, employed in making uh, masks for uh, refugees and producing in this particular location, the. The, the quota was 270,000 face masks to present themselves and the community. So they have been busy even during the pandemic. And as you can see, we've tried to reduce the number of tailors to also um, address the whole issue of social distancing as well. Next. Um, this is just really, uh, uh, it just shows you refugees listening to uh, health and sanitation messages over the PA systems in the camp. And whereas in the past, it would, you would expect to see a crowd, women, children, uh, you know, num many individuals from the same household here, we've tried to limit to one per household uh, and also to reduce uh, 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 the, the distances between them as they listen to uh, the messages. Uh, next, the next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, just really, it's a, a South Sudanese woman who's just received soap uh, for her family. And this is in, in a settlement in, in, in South Darfur. Is that the last? Okay, I think these are the last two slides. Um, this is uh, um, just to, to, to show you um, this is the, the slide on the, uh, with all the children would have been um, a, a refugee school prior to the pandemic. And this shows you the degree of overcrowding in our schools. Here they were participating in some kind of uh, an educational activity. And this slide shows you how children now are taking lessons at their dwelling places in their homes and trying to access uh, lessons on the radio. So it's just to give you a contrast between the two. Um, perhaps the last two slides or one slide, I'm not sure how many are left. Can we get to the next please? Now this is, I mentioned early on that of course admission to the territory is, is, is key for those fleeing persecution. Um, we had, uh, there were clashes internally in, in the DRC uh, there was a population that stayed in the border area for quite some time as we were able to negotiate, whilst we were negotiating access to the population with the Ugandan authorities because the border had been closed and um, even access to the border area 
um, had, was not possible. So we spent a few weeks negotiating access uh, with the government of Uganda, and that is just a slide to show you people coming in. And um, as of course we said with all uh, 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 governments in the region that we, UNHCR, will support their efforts to ensure that there is screening, um, self-isolation where necessary, isolation of groups where necessary, as well as quarantining, and we supported them in building up uh, uh, isolation centers, quarantine centers, to ensure that anybody coming into the territory seeking asylum uh, that has the virus doesn't transmit it to the greater community. So in as much as I would say governments announced publicly that borders were closed, we were able to negotiate. And in almost every instance, uh, we were able to achieve uh, uh, the admission of these uh, very uh, vulnerable uh, individuals. Um, I think that's the last slide. Uh, uh, Gela, over to you. Thank you. So this has been just very, so informative and we so appreciate your time, um, knowing that it's late into the night or evening for you. Now, um, it's been just very informative, of course, very tragic. Um, it was also, though, very heartening to hear the many ways in which you're continuing to do the work and the many ways in which um, people on the ground, refugees themselves, have been just trying to live their lives till you know they have a way to actually have some durable solution and move on. Um, so thank you. Do you have any concluding words you want to say? No, I think just really thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, I, I, it's unfortunate I wasn't able to take uh, any more questions, but I do have colleagues that are, um, have been manning the, 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 the chat. And if there's a way or if somebody can perhaps put uh, their email address, we'll, we'll be more than happy to, to share the response with them. Uh, perhaps I've been a bit too enthusiastic in trying to share with you uh, the challenges of, of, of a group that really, I think a lot of people don't really understand um, some of the, the unique challenges they face, but also some of the work that is, is taking place uh, in trying to, to build their resilience and, and uh, equally importantly, trying to give them opportunities to contribute uh, to the communities that uh, uh, are so uh, uh, ready to receive them and in, in, in this region. Um, host them for decades. So just to say a big thank you to, to you and to Northwestern for creating this opportunity. Um, I hope that uh, we will have opportunities to speak again on refugees. But as I said, we, we do have an office in, in Washington and in New York, and my colleagues there will be more than happy to respond to any queries, questions, um, and any individual uh, issues that they have, they will be uh, willing to transmit them to me here um, in the region. So just to say a big thank you uh, to me sitting here in Nairobi. Thank you. And you have many thank yous in the chat, if you could yeah. see them. And everybody has been just very um, grateful for the information that you've provided today. So thank you.